every story appears ordinary until you see the core side of it. And what you're looking for is a story behind the news. We bring it to you from Lagos, the commercial capital of Nigeria. Giving you all sides and political stories round the clock. Every detail from the start line to the final whistle. Core TV News, expanding your view. Hello and welcome to Core TV Primetime News, reaching you live from our Lagos studios. I'm Oluyemisi Olubi, and here are the top stories we're tracking at this hour. And now we we'll begin by telling you that the Lagos State's government will formally welcome President Muhammadu Buhari on Monday, the 23rd of May 2016, on a two-day working visit. The trip will be President Buhari's first official visit to the Senate since, to the state rather, since he assumed office about a year ago. Lagos State's Commissioner for Information and Strategy, Steve Ayonridi, revealed that this is the first time in about 15 years that a sitting president will be visiting the state on a working visit. During the visit, President Buhari will formally commission the Lagos State Emergency Management Agency Rescue Unit in Kappa Oshudi. The President will thereafter commission the newly constructed Ago Palace Way in Okota Isolo, after which he will pay homage to the Oba of Lagos, His Royal Majesty Oba Babatunde Rewan Aremu Akiolu at Igaidugara, Lagos Island. The Commissioner further discussed that President Buhari would later in the day be hosted to a reception rally by the state government at the Tafawa Balewa Square, where he will also commission and hand over security equipment and vehicles contributed by the governor, Akimi Ambade led administration, to security agencies in a bid to beef up security in the state. The national convention organized by the PDP in Port Harcourt, River State, has been postponed. Chairman of the party, Ali Madu Sharif, says the convention was postponed due to curt injunctions. However, former governor of Kaduna State, Ahmed McCarthy, has been elected, the party's caretaker national chairman by another faction of the party. Furthermore, a splinter group led by Jerry Ghana gathered in Abuja to hold a parallel convention after the pro-Sharif group insisted on its plan to organize the convention in Port Harcourt. The Ghani group is said to be favorably disposed to the idea of putting in place a caretaker committee to run the affairs of the party pending the conduct of an acceptable national convention. And still on the PDP, the PDP has constituted an eight-man caretaker committee to run the affairs of the party for a period of 90 days. Udwak Godwin reports that the committee came up in line with the party's Congress election, which was scheduled to take place, but was cancelled due to injunctions by the court. But still with politics, it has been a year since the People's Democratic Party lost its 16 years dominance of the Nigerian political scene. But today there are two factions with different leaders having two separate conventions at two locations in the country on the same day. While one faction of the party is holding a convention in Abuja, another faction in Port Harcourt attempted to do so. Our correspondent, Anete Patrick, who attended the Abuja convention, brings us more. Stalwarts of the People's Democratic Party are agreeing that mistakes within the party caused them to lose the 16th year grip it had on the reins of power in the country. Impunity, disdain for democratic norms and lack of trust are among the many reasons adduced by some of the members for the failure and controversies currently being experienced in the party. Mindful of our role as elders and conscious of our great party, 
We, the elders, in reviewing recent events, have come to the painful conclusion that the culture of impunity, disdain for democratic norms, and utter disregard of our party constitution, behaviors that brought us to 2015 loss are rearing their ugly heads again. The emergence of Ali Modu Sharif as a party's chairman is seen as a gross violation of the party's ethics, vision, and the ideals of the party. The Port Harcourt Convention, in their opinion, is also against the principles of selecting the national chairman. The action of the National Executive Committee of the party in selecting Senator Ali Modu Sharif as chairman of the party was in gross violation of the established procedure for the selection that we know. The selection of the chairman of the, of, 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 for the unexpected term of the Northeast uh, Zone started with nominations from the states in the zone. Senator Sharif was not nominated by any state caucus and has not qualified to be elected. The party has to go back to the vision of the founding fathers, especially in picking who becomes chairman as a way of portraying internal democracy. I just want to assure you and to remind you that in the vision of the founding fathers, the PDP was founded first and foremost to a free and democratic society in Nigeria. We are the ones who are the promoters of democracy. That is why the founding fathers chose for us that whenever we are gathered, we should really remind ourselves that PDP is power to the people. The different zonal representative also gave a piece of their mind on the essence of the convention as the party managers are seeming to be derailing from the norms without realizing that power has changed hands. We are gathered here as stakeholders and as concerned leaders of PDP to point out that the party managers now have derailed from the original concept. We are saying here, this is a moment in a gathering for realization. This is a moment when we are bringing to Nigerians a new product. The product that we never had before will make us lose election. Fairness and integrity. The leaders over there, they have enormous integrity. They want to provide level playing field for all Nigerians. The convention was not without the pulse of the women leader calling for more women participation in the decision-making organs of the party, as well as creates room for the youth. I'll be here and I'll continue to be here. We are here to stand firm as a woman. No more giving the post to PDP woman leader. A woman can be given the position of vice chairman, national secretary, national treasurer. As the nation awaits the outcome of Port Harcourt Convention, many of the members are of the opinion that more of the right things need to be done to turn the fortunes of the party back on track. Anita Patrick, Court TV News, Abuja. And from politics, we move to matters of the Nigerian budget, where the Nigerian Bar Association is worried over the late passage of the nation's appropriation bill into law, which, according to it, has become a characteristic of Nigerian governments. NBA President Augustine Alege, who expressed this view at a news conference in Abuja, insisted that late signing of the budget does not go well for the nation. Our judiciary correspondent, Vasil Okafo, has more. After several months of controversy, President Muhammad Buhari on May 6 finally signed into law the 2016 budget. Though President Buhari assures Nigerians that the budget will be implemented to the letter and that it will bring the much needed change and development to all parts of the country. The Nigerian Bar Association is, however, expressing worry that the federal government may not achieve enough implementation of the budget due to its late signing. The umbrella body of lawyers in the country wants government to change its method of passing the annual appropriation bill late in order to ensure good economic development of the country. According to the leadership of the association, there are several factors that make it difficult 
for government to achieve full budget implementation once it is not signed early in the year. By the time you are presenting a budget, you should not create situations where the budget you are presenting or you are going to work with is inherently self-defeating. That is, you have to take so many steps before you get to actual implementation. In spite of the late passage of this year's appropriation bill into law, Nigerians are looking up to Buhari's administration to fulfill its promise by making the budget the real change they desire. Basil Okafo, Court TV News, Abuja. And still on bills, a group of known a group known as the Maritime Advocacy Group is drumming legislative support for the proposed National Transport Bill due for presentation to the House of Reps on Monday. The group observed that the transport industry is the live wire of our national life and prosperity and as such requires the creation of an economic regulator. Our National Assembly correspondent Emmanuel Ehijene files in this report. A member of the group and one-time member of the House of Representatives, West Idaosa, is urging lawmakers to pass the document into law as it will not only help to develop the country's local economy through the protection of interest of end users of transport services, but also create jobs as well. For a number of years, people have been agitating for an economic regulator in the transport industry generally. There has been some level of unfairness poor pricing, lack of control of competition, and so on and so forth. And then when this bill came up, many in the industry welcomed it as a solid idea that can uh, keep the equilibrium that we wanted in the industry. He however advised lawmakers to disregard the proposed pending bill known as the Ports and Harbor Bill 2015. According to him, Section 1, Subsection 3, Subsection F, which purports to protect the rights and interests of port service providers and commercial port users, is best suited for a neutral economic regulator and not a service provider like the Port and Arbor Authority. We only want to highlight the area that we worry about. Now, alongside the National Transport Commission bill, there is also another bill that's being proposed, the Nigerian Ports and Harbor Authority bill. And the problem we have is that some of the areas that have been taken care of by the National Transport Commission Bill are also included in the Nigerian Ports and Harbor Authority Bill. With trained personnel and structure in different zones of the country, all that is needed, according to him, is to upgrade it to the status of the proposed commission to cut the cost of recruitment, training, and provision of infrastructure. And as regards the ongoing NLC strike, the AKT State Police Command have warned labor leaders against embarrassing or subjecting any AKT State resident to inhumane treatment over the ongoing nationwide strike call to protest against the hike in the price of petrol. The command says the threat by the leadership of the Nigeria Labor Congress and Joint Negotiating Council to disrupt business activities in Adoikiti could undermine the security of the state and give hoodlums undue advantage to wreak havoc on the populace. Speaking with journalists in Adwekiti, the Commissioner of Police, Etop James, says the command views the threat handed down by the Labour leaders to enforce a sit-at-home order at all costs with seriousness. And in Bielsa State, workers protesting their backlog of unpaid salaries stumped ministries in Yenagoa, the state capital, to enforce their industrial action. The angry workers ensured the secretariat was locked and all the offices closed in total compliance with the directive of their union. Their action was in defiance of the no-work, no-pay threat of the state governor, Syriaki Dixon, whose inability to pay different categories of workers had thrown the state into economic hardship. Bayelsa State is owing its civil servants for about five months, pensioners about eight months, and local government workers for about 13 months. Reports indicate non-payment of salaries has brought the economy of Bayelsa, known generally as a civil service state, to its knees, with many business ventures shutting down operation. The workers resorted to strike after 21-day ultimatum they gave the state government expired, with the governor not able to meet their demands. 
And now to matters as regarding the kidnapped Chibok girls. The management of Konike International School, Oshobo, in collaboration with Delta School District in Vancouver, Canada, has offered to give full scholarships to the first two Chibok girls rescued from the captivity of the Boko Haram sect. Amina Ali, with her four-month-old baby, and Sarah Luca, were rescued this week from Sambisa Forest, which is the hideout of the dreaded terror group. The director of Kunike International School, Amos Adekunle, announced the offer in Oshobo on Saturday. He says the girls need to be encouraged to fulfill their dreams of getting quality education, which was temporarily stopped by the terrorists who invaded their schools on April 14, 2014 and abducted over 200 girls. And to matters of, cor of corruption, operators of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission have sealed off buildings and other property allegedly belonging to Apere Mbelakbo, a former aide of Bayelsa State's Governor Syriake Dixon. Investigation on Saturday revealed that a building said to be owned by Mbelakbo on Azikoro Road, Yenegua, was taken over by the EFCC. Mbelakbo is being investigated by the EFCC for allegedly diverting 800 million naira meant for MDG programs and projects in Bielsa State. His wife is also being probed by the anti graft agency for alleged offences of money laundering, forgery and suspicious transactions amounting to 200 million naira. The EFCC had earlier nabbed a former senior special assistant on media to Dixon, Abednego Don Evarada in Port Arcos River State allegedly offering a bribe of 10 million naira to the EFCC zonal head in Port Harcourt, Ishak Saliu. Don Evarada reportedly ran into trouble when he allegedly approached Saliu over the case involving Mbelakbo and his spouse, Beauty. We'll go on a commercial break now. Do join us again. VAT, Value Added Tax is a tax paid on all goods and services and remitted by the seller of the goods or provider of the service to government. 5% VAT is added to the total cost of goods and services in Nigeria and when remitted to government is used for funding development. The VAT you pay will be used by government to develop our transport infrastructure like roads and railway lines to continually improve our educational sector by building more schools and upgrading existing ones to provide adequate security and a better quality of life for us all. Pay your VAT. Make your contributions to the development of Nigeria. It pays to pay your tax. This message is from the Federal Inland Revenue Service. Thanks for joining us again. And here's a reminder of our top stories. like to remind you that all you need to do to get more updates on our new stories is to visit our social media platforms. On Facebook, we have facebook.com forward slash TV news. And you can also check out our Twitter handle at Core TV news NG. Or you can subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash TV Never space news. And now we'll take you to Kogi State where unidentified gunmen have kidnapped the traditional ruler of a little town in Kogi, Aminu Aku. Aku was kidnapped by a gang of five masked gunmen in his town located on the Lokoja at Jaukuta Highway. The incident came barely 24 hours after the kidnap of two chieftains of the Kwara chapter of the APC on the Lokoja or Kene Road. Aku, a third class traditional ruler, was said to be returning from a function at Ajaokuta and was just alighting from his car when he was abducted. The gunmen are requesting for a 10 million naira ransom. The Nigerian army lost three soldiers in two different boat accidents in Bayosa and Delta states respectively. 
even as another explosion was recorded on an oil facility in Delta State when suspected militants hit the Escravos Worry gas pipeline around Agbeljo, Worry's southwest local government area of Delta State. In the first incident, two soldiers died in the accident involving a military boat carrying soldiers who were in an operation to carry out an on-the-spot assessment of the destruction of the Escravos Worry gas pipeline. The team on the boat was heading to the scene of the pipeline explosion when the boat capsized, killing two soldiers. Reports indicate that those behind the attack used dynamites and other dangerous weapons to carry out the attack. The Nigerian Navy has handed over four suspected pipeline vandals to the Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps for further investigation and possible prosecution. The commander, NNS Beecroft, Abraham Adaji, who handed over the suspects, say they, are arrest they were arrested at the Santan Beach, Igbologun community in Badagri State, in Badagri, Lagos State. The Navy also handed over 25 liters of 218 kegs filled with stolen petroleum products, which was recovered after the raid of the Vandals' hideout. The suspected Vandals were identified as 20-year-old Francis Agbaje, 24-year-old Aram Jack, 23-year-old Matthew Apperton, and 24-year-old John Honfor. <clears throat> and I will take you to Aquibam State where communities have been urged to stop unnecessary friction, conflict and protests but embrace industries established in their areas by providing a congenial environment for the companies to operate and break even for the overall development of the host and the state. The state's governor, Udom Emmanuel, made the call while inspecting facilities at the operational base of Amalgamated Oil Company, Nigeria Limited, located at Mboku Uko Akai in Irwe Ofong area local government area of the state. He argued that without an, en an enabling environment, investors cannot be attracted to explore the abundant resources available in the state, noting that companies attract other subsidiary companies that generate more jobs, create wealth and contribute to the development of the state. The governor maintained that his administration is poised to generate wealth by attracting investors who would engage in the people who engage the people meaningfully rather than sharing money to a few individuals and groups under the guise of empowerment. And now we take it to part two states where artisans are lamenting the shortage of electricity supply. The situation, they say, has been worsened by the fuel scarcity. Speaking with our correspondents in just the Plateau State capital, most of the residents describe the situation as a business killer. The report is presented from our studios. This is the staccato sound of generosity that Nigeria has found itself in not meeting citizens' electricity need, which has put over 10,000 megawatts, but can barely generate steadily 2,000 megawatts in a month. The situation has worsened at Apata, Busa, Buji, Laranto, Tudungwada, Zamangada, to mention but a few who have been put in darkness for days. Electricity consumers, especially owners of small businesses, are growing over the unstable power supply of the new electricity tariff. And then a bit too much below of what it will see about 1,003 days or on our business and we'll stick it. And nobody will stick on our lights. If they flash and we did that thing, they will collect them. Five hours, no, see anything. Our super is spoiled for fish. Because if they gave you work, if you collect the work, you give them a date and time that you're supposed to finish up the work. So because of there's no light, the customer will come to the complaint. According to the Public Relations Officer Just Electricity Distribution Company, the low power supply being experienced lately is caused largely by challenges with gas supply, the generators, as well as vandalization of unpatriotic citizens. She says Just Office usually requires about 250 megawatts, now gets less than 100 megawatts to service Plato, Benue, and Bauchi states. All the discourse are included from the 
allocation to receive from the national youth is low. On the areas in just thrown into total darkness. It's an accident where a big lorry with load affected our our wires. But presently we have communicated with those in charge. Though with huge investment in nation's power sector, the sector is still far away from its destination because the key factors that determine its progress are yet to be fixed or reviewed. Four students of the Federal University of Technology, Akure, have died in a road accident on the akure Ilesha Expressway in Ifedore, local government area of Ondo State. Confirming the incident, spokesman for the police command in Ondo State, Femi Johnson, says apart from the four dead students, 11 others were injured. Joseph further confirms that the remains of the students have been deposited at the Ondo State Specialist Hospital, Akure, where those injured are being hospitalized. No fewer than 15 students were in the bus when the accident happened. In Kano State, now the state's Pilgrims Welfare Board has directed intending pilgrims on the 2016 Hajj to Saudi Arabia to go for a mandatory medical test. Public Relations Officer of the Board, Nuhu Badamasi, says the medical test is critical because no intending pilgrim would be allowed to travel to the Holy Land without knowing his or her health status. According to the official, the mandatory medical test is in compliance with the directive of the National Hajj Commission of Nigeria. But Amosi further reveals that pilgrims must attend the screening at the des designated government hospitals with the necessary Hajj payment receipt for easy identification. The Hajj exercise is expected to end within the next two weeks with no fewer than 5,600 intended pilgrims from Kano State. And on matters of science and technology, Minister Ogbonaya Onu has pledged to assist the West Africa Infectious Disease Institute with research facilities from its agencies because he believes infectious diseases can impede the economic development of the country if not curtailed. He says infectious diseases pres presently constitute about 70% of the nation's health challenges, adding that the ministry will avail relevant institutes with its infrastructure to eradicate any infectious disease. The minister spoke when the Director General of the National Agency for Control of AIDS, WHO, who also doubles as the co-chairman of YD, John Idoku, paid him a visit to solicit the ministry's support at the weekend in Abuja. ONU says the National Biotechnology Development Agency under the ministry played an important role in the production of Ebola kits for the eradication of the Ebola virus in 2014. And in business-related news, independent oil marketers have raised alarm that any devaluation of the Naira by the federal government before offsetting their foreign exchange differentials may not present a healthy economy for the downstream oil industry. Addressing the Minister of Finance in Abuja, members of the Depot and Petroleum Products Marketers Association, led by Dakbo Abiodu, say they are worried that devaluation of the Naira may affect their ability to bid for foreign exchange and as such may not be able to liquidate their forex liabilities with their foreign bankers. While thanking the federal government for the recent release of 42.6 billion Naira payments, which was made last week, Dakwa Abiodun says all marketers are bidding to liquidate foreign exchange liabilities to their foreign bankers. The Central Bank of Nigeria says 120 billion Naira out of the 213 billion Nigerian electricity market stabilization facility has been disbursed in four trenches. CBN Governor Godwin Emefiele, who disclosed this during the disbursement of the fourth trench of 55 billion 450 million naira to power companies in Lagos, noted that the project is meant to improve the power situation in the country. According to the CBN Governor, a review of the fund utilization and reports of impact by beneficiaries revealed that the intervention resulted in the restoration of a total of 900 and 5 megawatts of power to the grid as a result of, of facility turnaround 
and maintenance, which contributes over 25% of the annual cap capital expenditure budget for the sector. Emir Fele said the new fund marked a major milestone in the efforts of the Apex Bank in collaboration with the federal government to achieve a contract-based electricity market which features the signing of power purchase agreements, activation agreements by Nigerian electricity bulk trader. The fund was dispersed to 24 industry participants which include three distribution companies and 14 generation companies. We'll go for another short break. Do join us again. With over 7 billion of world population and still counting, the world needs to hear you now than ever. Whatever your ministry or vision is, Gospel Africa will help get you there faster than you think possible. For inquiries and participation, contact 009. 503-3859 or 0812-076-0011 or visit www.gospelafricang.com Gospel Africa, the number one media solution for the church today. Gospel Africa, showing on this station at this time. Thanks for joining us again. And now we'll begin with a foreign scene going to the United States in particular, where President Barack Obama has condemned the decision of the United States Congress for not supporting his request for a $1.9 billion fund to combat the spreading Zika virus. He stated this after figures show that nearly 300 pregnant women in the United States had tested positive for Zika and further warned that the country could face bigger problems in future. Obama also reveals that the Senate had agreed to only half of the required funding and the House of Representatives only a third. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization has declared the Zika virus a global health emergency after the virus is discovered to cause serious birth defects and capable of spreading through mosquito bites and sexual contacts. And in Mexico, the Mexican government has approved the extradition of drug lord Yakin Guzman, also known as El Chapo, to the United States to face charges bordering on smuggling and murder. The notorious drug lord was recaptured in January, six months after escaping through a tunnel from his maximum security prison cell. After his apprehension, Mexican authorities transferred him in May to a prison near the U.S. border. Meanwhile, Guzman's lawyers say they will appeal against the decision, which may lead to the process dragging on for months. Guzman faces charges from seven U.S. federal prosecutors. He is also accused of money laundering and arms and drugs possession. And in Bangladesh, strong winds and heavy downpours unleashed by Cyclone Rano have already left 14 people dead and forced tens of thousands to flee their homes as the storm is poised to make landfall in southern Bangladesh, following a warning that an expected storm surge up to 1.5 meters could flood villages and towns along the coast. Authorities have taken 60,000 people to cyclone shelters in the meantime. The peripheral wind of the cyclone has already hit the coastal areas. And to Iraq now, the Iraqi forces have killed at least two people while trying to disperse protesters who broke into the fortified green zone area in central Baghdad after at least 57 people wounded in it, were wounded in the unrest, in which forces used tear gas, water cannons and sound bombs against protesters, some of whom threw rocks and other debris. Officials say at least two protesters have died of bullet wounds. Followers of Iraqi cleric Muqtada al-Sada have been protesting for weeks, demanding reforms and a new government, and had warned they would again break into the green zone if progress was not made. This is the second time in two weeks that protesters are able to breach the green zone. And our sports. Power style, and that's what he delivered. Begin in Kaduna State, where the conducive atmosphere and sporting facilities has continued to attract national competitions 
as no fewer than 100 players from across the country between the ages of 10 to 18 are expected to participate in the 10th edition of the Junior Tennis Championship held in Kaduna. Representatives of the expansers Tiki Tanga says the competition is to discover young talents and nurture them to limelight while establishing a strong transition platform for the senior category. Our Kaduna State correspondent has more. The championship, which is holding in the northern part of the country for the first time in 10 years, will provide a platform that will attract and enable junior players from all over the country to compete and showcase their talents. She says the championship is designed to serve as a feeder to the senior championship, adding that the management has recorded success in the junior championship as players from the junior circuit have always represented the country in the African Tennis Championship and other international competitions. We hope that as more junior players take advantage of the Central Bank of Nigeria Junior Circuit, we shall produce an even larger pool of talent. With improved and continuous sponsorship, Nigeria will not only excel in the sport, but provide tremendous engagement and empowerment opportunities for our youth. On its part, the Commissioner for Youth and Sport, Kaduna State, Daniel Dan Alta, applauded the sponsors of the championship, adding that they have contributed to grassroots development of sports in the state. He says the event have brought success in the state, adding that more talents will be discovered this year. In no small way, the junior tournament have proved a very tremendous success in the past years. Winners of the age 16 and 18 categories are expected to contest in the CBN Senior Open Tennis Championship. The competition is expected to hold from May 23rd to 28th at the Mutala Mohammed Square Tennis Court, Kaduna. And in football, Nigerian international winger Ahmed Musa has won the 2015-2016 Russia Premier League title with CSK Moscow. CSK beat Rubin Kazan 1-0 on the final day of the season to claim their 13th league title. Alan Zagov scored the decisive goal on the 19th minute in the 10th game decided at the Kazan Arena. Musa, who took part in the contest, was eventually substituted in the third minute of second half stoppage time with Alexei Berezutsky taking his place. The Nigerian speedster has enjoyed a hugely successful season with CSKA as he netted 13 times in the league and 18 goals in all competitions for the club. He also helped them reach the Russian Cup final, where they eventually suffered defeat to Zenit St. Petersburg, as well as the group stages of the UEFA Champions League. And in South Africa, Kaiser Chiefs ended the 2015-2016 ABSA Premiership season in the fifth place, following a 2-0 defeat to Chipa United at FNB Stadium on Saturday afternoon. Having watched Mamelodi Sundowns run away with the league title they won in emphatic style last season, Chiefs were eager to end the season on a high. But a sixth defeat of the campaign meant the Amakosi finished the season a whooping 25 points behind the newly crowned champions. Victory for Chipa United secured a sixth place finish. The Chile boys' highest finish in South Africa's top flight. Goals from Buyani Sali and Lerato Manzini leading the Eastern Cape side to their 13th win of the season. And in England, Jesse Lingard's extra time Thunderbolt earned Manchester United a record equaling 12th FA Cup as Louis van Gaal's side came from behind to defeat Crystal Palace 2-1 at Wembley. In a rematch of the 1990, 1990 final, which United won after a replay, with the, with the tie heading towards penalties, substitute Lingard drilled a stunning volley past a motionless Wayne Hennessy in the 110th minute to end United's 12-year wait to lift the FA Cup and give their supporters something to cheer about at the end of a tumultuous season. Its win is United's first FA Cup win since 2004, allowing captain Wayne Rooney and Michael Carrick to complete their collection of domestic medals and took them level with Arsenal as the most successful clubs in the competition's illustrious history. 
But while Van Gaal celebrated his first trophy in English football and United's first major honor since Alex Ferguson's retirement in 2013, it may not be enough to keep him in the job following the club's failure to qualify for the Champions League. And still in England, Watford have announced that former Inter Milan boss Walter Mazzarini will become head coach from 1st of July after a departure of Kike Sanchez Flores, who left after less than a year with the Premier League side. Watford finished 13th in a season where they also lost in the FA Cup semi finals to Crystal Palace. 54 year old Italian Mazzari, who has also managed Sampdoria and Napoli, signed a three year contract at Vicarage Road. With this signing, Mazzari becomes the Hannes' eighth manager in the past four years. And in tennis, world number two, Andy Murray, says his firm means he does not need to appoint a new coach before the French Open. Murray, who separated from coach Amelia Moresmo this month, beat Novak Djokovic for the first time on clay last week to win the Italian Open. Meanwhile, Moresmo describes the Briton as complex and suggested his behavior on court was a factor behind the split. British former player Delgado joined the Scots setup in February and his first tournament as sole coach ended with Murray beating world number one Djokovic in Rome. Murray, however, says he has not spoken to any prospective coaches but is open to the idea of bringing someone new into his team. And that's how we drop the anchor on Core TV Primetime News. But before we go, here's a recap of our top stories. And that's all we have for you tonight. Do join us at 12 a.m. for more updates. I'm Oluyemishi Olubi. Thanks for joining us.